If you didn't see the, the family meeting that we had planned for tonight to vote on the building has been uh, pushed three weeks. Uh, I sent an email uh, about this, posted a video uh, kind of with some of the more details around that. And so you didn't see that. You can check that out. And if you haven't been watching the videos, uh, you want to watch the one that I posted um, today. Uh, it's kind of a bonus video that gives you a little backstage look at the amount of struggle that I actually had at putting these videos together. And so you can kind of poke fun at my expense. But again, building vote, not tonight, but three weeks from now, we felt that um, more time in prayer, answering uh, your questions and, and casting some more vision uh, really wouldn't hurt anything and only create more unity within us as a body. And so that's why we're doing that. Now, one thing that I did want to say about all this and kind of moving the building vote and all those sorts of things is that this is in no way kind of a crisis situation for us as a church. I mean, it's not as if we just kind of thought up this whole building expansion idea over the last couple of weeks and we're like, well, this might be a good idea. No, it's like we've been anticipating this moment for many, many years. We've had a team of people uh, specifically working on this um, since really last November, and I've shared that a couple times. You knew nothing about this whole building thing was going on, and you really weren't paying very good attention. We've had some people planning this. This is all very planned, very intentional, but really, at the end of the day, it's not a crisis because building or not, we're going to be all right. We're, we're in Jesus' hands. He's with us. He's for us. He's promised that nothing's going to stop his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and so building or not, we're going to be all right if we keep pursuing him. Jesus is the first thing, and if we have Jesus in our midst, and his presence and power is amongst us. He's blessing us. I mean, anything is possible for us. So let me make it clear. I'm going to say this over and over again. Jesus is the win. The building is not the win. Uh, the building is maybe like an RBI single that helps more people to experience the celebratory win that is Christ. But Jesus is the win. So with this building, however... We are envisioning a very bright future for Cornerstone Church and what God has in store for us. We're not looking at five years down the road. Uh, we are looking at five decades into the future. And when your vision uh, is, is bigger than what you can just see kind of right in front of you and what you can see within the next couple of years maybe, but you can see beyond that and see a greater vision, uh, you will take greater steps of faith and you will take greater risk uh, for the gospel to attain that vision. If we were only seeing five years into the future, if we could only see five years, then we would not be doing this building. I mean, that would be absolutely foolish. We would be much better off just taking that money and just giving it all away, right? But if we are thinking 50 years, decades into the future, we're seeing this building as an investment that will produce abundantly more fruit for the kingdom, will facilitate more generosity, more money being given away to our city and to the nations, and a much greater impact will be made in this city for generations to come. Now, if our vision is as small as a building, we're in trouble. If our vision is as small as a building, we will not accomplish much of eternal value at all, if anything. Our vision has to extend so far beyond a larger building. I mean, I was thinking about Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, you know, the one I'm talking about, the one that was delivered on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And, and what Martin Luther King Jr. was dreaming, it was bigger than equality for whites and blacks. It, it, was, it was bigger than the guaranteed unalienable rights for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all people regardless of the color of one's skin. Because if you'll remember, <clears throat> when King Jr. gets to the end of that speech, he has these series of uh, I have a dream statements. He says, uh, you know, I have a dream that former slaves and former slave owners will sit down at the same table and share a meal together. He says, I have a dream that my four little children <coughs> will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. He says, I have a dream that little white boys and little white girls will hold hands with little black boys and little black girls. And then he gets to the end of his speech and he continues dreaming, but he lifts his eyes even higher 
seeing beyond the horizon, and he's dreaming Isaiah 40 when he says, I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. That's a dream worth dreaming. And, and that's a dream that Martin Luther, King, Martin Luther King Jr. is dreaming that isn't some sort of wish, but it's a certainty because it is established on the promise of God. It's a window. I mean, he sees through the lens of this great cultural issue that's at stake, and he's looking forward to a brighter future for all of God's children. And so what we are dreaming is way beyond a building. And we're looking forward to a greater future that goes so far beyond the horizon of our lives. And so that's where I want to take us this morning. We don't know what the future holds for us. You don't know what tomorrow even holds for you. I don't know what, if we're going to move forward with this building or not. I don't know what the days of Cornerstone look, look like, but I do have a glimpse into the future. And so do you. And this future that I want to show you is envisioned by Jesus himself. And so... It's a certainty. This vision is inevitable. It's impossible for this not to happen. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 5. And I'm going to ask my dear daughter in the green dress, would you go get me a, a cup of water? I yell a lot in the sermon today, and my voice is already, I'm already losing it. Because uh, it's exciting what we're looking at today. If you don't get excited about this, I don't know what to tell you. But uh, Revelation chapter 5. The book of Revelation, it lifts us up out of the trees of our short existence on this planet, and it helps us see the forest of the purpose of all of human history and where everything is headed. Here we get a glimpse of where everything is moving. All of history is moving towards this day, and you're going to be there, and I'm going to be there. We're all going to be a part of this, and here's the thing. like When you can get a glimpse of where all of human history is headed, um, where all meaning and purpose is, is going, and you know the meaning of the moment that you're living in, and you can make sense of the meaning of your life, and the meaning of Cornerstone Church, and the meaning of this country that we're in, if you see that, you will feel the, the, the pull to, thank you, babe, to joyfully get on board with God, because the future that he's dreaming up for, for you and for me is far greater than what we can envision for ourselves. So how is this story going to end? Where is this all leading to? What is the future that is coming for us? Let's begin reading in verse 1, see if we can't make sense of our lives and our church and and the here and now in light of the day that is to come. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him, so this is God the Father, who's seated on the throne, a scroll, written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. So the Apostle John, he's got this vision from Jesus, and he's seeing where all of human history is headed. And at the center of all human life, at the center of the world, the center of life and meaning and purpose and existence is a throne. And seated on the throne is God the Father. And you have to see what, the, the, what John is seeing. I mean, he describes it for us in Revelation 4. I'm going to read a couple verses from Revelation 4 to you where John is trying to put into words what he's seeing. What you picture in your mind as I read this is going to fall woefully short of the beauty and glory is there, that is there. What, what you can kind of put together in your mind of this scene is as if you were to try and draw a picture of the Grand Canyon with dull map pencils versus the reality of actually being there. But do the best you can. This is what he describes. Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. He says, At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper, Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne 
were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight, and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around them within, and day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Can you imagine a scene? much more majestic than this. This is the glory of God on full display. There is awe, there is fear, there is joy, there is worship. You dare not look, but you can't but look. And this is the scene right now in heaven. When we worship God in this place, we are joining all of heaven, just as we just did a second ago, singing, holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty who is and who was and who is to come. Could this scene get any more glorious? And it does because in the hand of the Father is a scroll written on front and back, sealed with seven seals. What is written on the scroll? What's on this scroll? If you read further into the book of Revelation, you will see that On this scroll, it it contains God's sovereign plan for the unfolding of human history, leading up to the consummation of his kingdom. So it is God's sovereign will for creation and redemption and the eradication of sin and suffering and pain and death. And it's the ultimate restoration of God's people to himself and the recreation of the new heavens and the new earth where God's people will be with him forever and ever, enjoying him and worshiping him, and and it's in his hand. Isn't that good news? God holds this in his hand. Aren't you glad that neither Donald Trump nor Kamala Harris holds our future in their hands? I mean, as this political season unfolds, and you watch these debates, and you read the news, and you see the campaigns, and you think, oh my gosh, like, Whose hands are we in right now? Like, where is this country heading? What is happening? Do not fear. God is in control. He holds the world in the palm of his hands, and it's literally written on this scroll. Verse 2, and I saw a, a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? Who is worthy to... Open these seals, unfold God's plan, right? So in the midst of this scene, amidst the glorious worship that's happening, myriads of angels, myriads of angels and living beings and representations from all over the four corners of the earth, every language and nation and tribe and people, they're all there. It's culminating in this moment, and an angel cries out above the worship and praise that's happening and says with a loud voice that deafens the worship, who is worthy? Who's worthy? To take the scroll and to break its seals? It's kind of an odd question, you might think. I mean, why wouldn't God be worthy for this? I mean, isn't God the Father who holds the scroll in his hands? He's written what is on the scroll. He's ordained all this to come to pass. Who's worthy to open the scroll? Or why can't God just open it? Well, he could. But just think what would happen if God was to open that scroll. Remember, God is completely holy and just and perfect and without sin. And we all, every single one of us, and everyone that's gone before us, we all stand before God in our sin, sin condemned. The message of the Bible is that our sin separates us from a holy God. There is nothing, not a thing, that we can do to atone for our sin problem. We stand before God as enemies of him, separated from a holy, perfect, sovereign God for all of eternity. And so, if God the Father was to open this scroll, what would happen? Eternal judgment and eternal condemnation for every single one of us. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, so every human being 
get what they deserve, which is eternal condemnation and eternal judgment. This is what is rightly owed every single one of us because of our disobedience to a holy God. And so what was once a beautiful scene has now turned very bleak and grim. We are hopeless and helpless in our sin before a holy God. So then, who can open the scroll and break its seals? Who can unfold God's plans for redemption and restoration and recreation of the new heavens and the new earth? And look at verse 3. <clears throat> and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. No one is there that can open the scroll. I mean, think about this. Abraham, the father of the nation of Israel, he's there. He can't open the scroll. Moses is there. He's the man who's called the friend of God. He can't open the scroll. King David is there, the great king over Israel, the man who is a man after God's own heart. He's there. He can't open the scroll. The Apostle Paul, he's there, the greatest missionary to ever live, wrote half of our New Testament. He's there. He can't open the scroll. George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Spurgeon, the great Billy Graham, they're all there, the greatest preachers to ever live, and they can't open the scroll. All of us with them, and none of us, none of us dare, even collectively, to walk up to the throne of God and take that scroll because we know we are all sinners, and we are all utterly hopeless and condemned before God. And verse 4 says how we should feel if this was our ultimate eternality. And it says in verse 4, And I began to weep loudly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. The Apostle, Paul, or the Apostle John, he sees this, and he knows... He surely can't open the scroll or look into it. And so he begins to weep loudly. This is the Apostle John. He is wailing incessantly. Why? Not because he's like nosy and he just wants to know what's written on the scroll, but because he knows that if there isn't someone who can kind of be a mediator between sinful man and a holy God to open the scroll, then judgment is coming. This is what this means. This means that there is no eternal life. This means that there is no eradication of sin, suffering, and death. This means that there is no end to our pain. This means that there is no new heavens and new earth, and everything is ultimately meaningless. It's all over for us. And John is weeping because he knows that if, if this was to come, that this was all to come if there was no one worthy to open the scroll. And so you can imagine now that scene, that dark scene, it's been described before as like the saddest moment in the history of the world. And it's in that scene that all of heaven kind of begins to rumble like the sound of thunder and the deafening silence of no one being able to come forward is overcome by verse 5, which says, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Praise be to God. There is one who has been found that can stand before a holy God and before sinful humanity as a mediator between the two and can take the scroll from the hand of the Father and unfold what is God's sovereign plan for human history and all of creation. Who is this lion and this lamb? Who is worthy to approach the throne of God? It is Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, the only begotten Son of the Father. He is the, the creator and sustainer of all things. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he is the lamb who was slain. He is the one who has conquered sin, Satan, and death. And he has been made to be king over all the earth, and all creation is subject to him. This is why we sing to Jesus. This is why we are in this place right now. Like, don't you see that like, Jesus is worthy of, of our lives? He's, he's worthy of, of more than just kind of our casual 
church attendance on Sunday mornings. He's worthy of more than just our half-hearted devotion to him and our lip syncing of, of like the worship songs. He is worthy of our entire lives. He's worthy of our full devotion. And you look at him. Look at verse 6. It says, verse 6, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. All eyes turned towards Jesus who appears as a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Remember John the Baptist who said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. How did the Lamb take away the sins of the world? The Lamb takes away the sins of the world by being slaughtered. This Lamb was mocked, mocked, he was marred, he was hated, he was despised, he was beaten, he was scorned, he was spat upon, he was scourged. And he had nails driven in his hands and his feet as he was lifted up to be crucified for your sins and my sins. And so he appears as a lamb who has been slain, and so he was. But notice, this lamb is not dead. This lamb's not laying down. He's not defeated. It's not like the, the 24 elders are carrying this lamb. He's not wounded. This is the lamb who is standing. How does a slain lamb stand? He stands because he has defeated death as the conquering lion. This is the greatest news in all the world. The slaughtered lamb who takes away the sins of the world has defeated the grave and he reigns as the lion of the tribe of Judah as the sovereign Lord of all. And the boldness, the, like the boldness of it all, the audacity of it all, while every other created being in the history of the world stands woefully silent before God, with heads drooped low, dare not approach God's holy throne, the Lamb who was slain stands and walks to God the Father in front of all the living creatures of the earth, and he takes the scroll from his right hand who was seated on the throne. I mean, can you imagine that? What do you think happens next? Hopefully, if you're listening or paying attention at all, hopefully what's happening in your heart right now, because this is what happens next, verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You've made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne, living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, who received power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. This is exuberance of worship. Breaking out in all of heaven, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, the myriads and myriads of angels, all the people above God from every tribe, every language, every people, all the four corners of the earth, and they're crying out, worthy is the Lamb. Power, glory, honor, thanksgiving, strength, might be to your name forever and ever. And if you look back at verse 9, this is what is coming for you. This is the future that is coming for every single one of you who believe upon Christ, and it's coming for me too. This is the eternal vision that you can have for your life right now. Verse 9, and by your blood, you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom, a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. This is the heavenly future that is contained on the scroll for all those who have believed upon Christ and loved God, not judgment, not condemnation, not hell, not eternal suffering, but a kingdom and a king. History ends with the king gathering his ransomed around his throne to live with him in his kingdom forever and ever. And what will you be doing for all of eternity? We'll be worshiping and enjoying God. It says that we were made to be priests to our God. Do you know you're going to be a priest one day? 
You were made to be a priest. And what does that mean? This means you're going to be a priest in the kingdom, and so you have direct access to God and to declare his excellencies forever. We will stand before God uncondemned, in perfect relationship with him, with hearts full of worship and joy, and we shall reign with Christ forever and ever. Jesus, in the new heavens and the new earth, is going to fill the universe with his glorious rule through you. He's going to fill the universe, his glorious rule, through you and us who reign with him forever and ever. So, this is where all human history is headed, and I get it. Without supernatural help, we cannot really envision this. It's unfathomable. It's too marvelous. It's way too amazing. It's too big for our feeble minds, but I'm telling you, if we could just taste it, if we could just taste this thing, everything would change. Like, if we could just, mm, the Spirit would just help us to believe this just a little bit, the things of this world would grow strangely dim, and we would have much more boldness to tell others of what is to come with increasingly more power and courageousness. I mean, friends, we have, we have something worth sacrificing for. We, we have something worth giving our life. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it awesome that we have something that we know that is worth living for, that lives beyond us, that is for all of eternity? I mean, we cannot get caught up in lesser things. We cannot get tied down to the things of this world. We have so much coming for us in Christ. I mean, one day, we are all going to die. You're going to die. I'm going to die. We're all going to die. We're all going to be dead, right? One day, this building, if we build it, right, we're going to put a lot of money in this thing. It's going to be great. But this thing, one day, is going to be torn down. It's going to become ruins. Greatest nation in the world that we live in right now, the United States of America, will be nothing but a sentence in the history of God's world. But that eternal day that's coming for us in Revelation chapter 5, it is as sure as the rising sun. It's inevitable, and we are living for that day, right? How, how does a building fit into this? A building might just be the means by which we make a greater mark in our city for the Great Commission in the days ahead as we prepare that day to get, to get more people into that throne room with joy in their hearts worshiping Jesus on that day. But building or not, I mean, let's go there together. Let's chase after this together. Let's go all in for Jesus. He's worthy. And, and let me just tell you, when you see Jesus Christ on that day in Revelation chapter 5, and you stand around his throne, you will not regret having served your king faithfully and telling as many people as possible about what he's done for you and what he has in store for you for all of eternity. And... Maybe you're here today and, and you don't know Jesus, like you're, you're not a Christian. Or maybe you don't know, am, am I in or am I out? Where, where am I going to be? Where, where do I fall out on that day in Revelation chapter 5? Am I part of the goats or am I part of the sheep? I don't know. Well, if that's you, I want you to pay close attention right now. If you haven't listened to anything else I've said, listen to this, because this one minute could change your life forever. I, I want everyone in this room to just think for a moment about your eternal destiny right now. Stephen Covey the author of the New York Times best-selling book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, principle two of that book is this, begin with the end in mind. He says, imagine your death, your funeral, and think about what you want people to say about you on the day of your death, and then work backwards from that day. So you want to be a highly effective person, principle two, think about your death, work backwards, and you'll be, maybe you'll be effective, I don't know. It's a great practice, however, there's one big problem with that, and it's this. Death is not the end. Death is a semicolon. And after death is this scene in heaven and the throne and eternal life and e or eternal condemnation. And so don't, don't begin with death. Begin with Revelation 5 in mind. That's where your life is headed. And either you will stand before the throne of God condemned and judged for your sin. And you'll be there on that day and you will be weeping just like John is when you realize that what John was envisioning is going to happen for all those who stand condemned before God when, God, when Jesus opens up that scroll, and that's your reality, you will stand like John weeping on that day when he saw no hope and eternal separation from God forever and ever in hell. Or, or you will stand before the throne of God with exuberance of joy in your heart, with so much worship, 
because Jesus Christ is your Savior. He's taken away your sin by your faith in Him, and He's given you the gift of eternal life. You can guarantee that future today if you would but repent of your sins and trust in Christ. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God standing as those slain who takes away the sins of the world. Let's pray. Father, I, I just know, God, if you would help us by your Spirit to just get a taste of this, a little sliver of what's coming to us, everything would change. Our lives would change. I mean, everything. It's, it's, it's all different. It's all changed. We, we, would, so would, would you just help us to see this? I mean, would you help us to, to get where ultimate reality is headed? Help us to see beyond the trees of our everyday existence to the forest of the purpose of all humanity, where all this is headed, and help us to connect it all. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing. Shadows deep.